How are you doing there? Just a quickie before we start. On the Apple podcast, why don't you double click on David McWilliams Plus? It's right there when you open the podcast. You get ad free, you unlock early access. Just double click and away you go. David McWilliams Plus, you get this pure and simple. To understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. This podcast is powered by ACAST. How are you doing there? John and I are just talking about how lunch at a certain age is a much more <laughs> civilised event than dinner. Well, it is because you, you get out there and you have your lunch, you have your several bottles of wine, and then you're in bed by you're eight o'clock. You're in bed. This, this is what happens when you get very old. You're in bed by the clock. And when, usually I want to bed, John, these, these days. I'm obsessed now with this new TV series called Bad Girls. Oh? It's Sharon Horgan. It's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's it's, like, fantastic. It's, it's five She's... girls, five sisters, right? And the whole premise is they're trying to kill one of the brother-in-laws, right? Right. Who's a complete bollocks, okay? And it's all based in Malahide and Hoth and all around there. And it's great. And there's a, there's a new series. And then the final series, the 10th series, is tomorrow. Tomorrow, right. Friday. So I will have my lunch, <laughs> cover bottles, <laughs> yeah. cover snooze about five o'clock, then wake up about seven. I hope you make it through the whole program. <laughs> I, but it's very, very good. By the way, if you haven't seen it, Bad Sisters on Apple TV. It's really, really, really funny. It's also very Irish. All the actors, actresses are Irish. It's hilarious. It's really, really very good. And Sharon Horgan's got this she's extraordinary a, she's ability. A brilliant writer. Amazing writer. Amazing writer. So uh, uh, Sharon Horgan, as you, we know you're obviously a, a listener, but thank you very much. It's been an absolute hoot for the last couple of weeks. Now, John, I was in David. Donegal this week. I don't know Donegal, that awful, awful yeah, tragedy yeah, yeah, yeah. in the apple green. I mean, it's extra- horrible, horrible. But I drove to Donegal last Monday, I think it was last, to do an event in Letterkenny. And I hadn't been up on the Dublin Derry Road for quite some time. Mm. And the road to Derry from here to the border is grand. Okay, lots and lots of motorways, yeah, dual carriageways, yeah, yeah, yeah. bypasses, etc. You get to a little small village called Ochnacloy, and you then go back into the 1970s. <laughs> it's extraordinary. It's, a, it's as if you're actually going into the 70s, yeah. right? It's time warp It's stuff. like a time warp, right? You yeah. come out of the 21st century, you go into the mid-20th century, right? Tiny little <laughs> roads through the north. And then, uh, amazing, towns are not bypassed. So you go through in through Ochnacloy, yeah, through a place called Ballygawley. Yeah. Then into Oma, which is bypassed, but there's a little roundabout and it's thousands of cars in it. Yeah, yeah, then yeah. you go through a place called Sign Mills and you come out the far side, it's Straban. It takes you about two hours to get through the north. It takes you three and a half hours to get from Dublin the, to Letterkenny. What's amazing, though, is that back in the day, back in the 80s, when roads were shit here, like really crap. Yes. And then you'd cross the border and all of a sudden you have got top class roads. And top you know. class cars as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Yeah, that, but you're right. The infrastructure was amazing in the yeah. North. It's completely But it hasn't changed now. since then, is what you're saying. So what has happened in the North, right, is there's been so little spending on infrastructure. Yeah. Where we've spent a huge amount. And that particular road, now in fairness, there was supposed to be a motorway between Derry and Dublin. Derry, we forget, Derry is the fifth largest city on this island. It's is got it? a metropolitan population. Really? Yes, wow. it's got a metropolitan population, an urban population of 100,000, but a metropolitan population of the Derry catchment area of 210,000 people. It's wow. big. It's wow, really wow, big. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And it's not connected at all. So Dublin, Derry, it's an unbelievably difficult drive. And the problem is that you get into the north and they haven't done anything. And they were supposed to do, under the Belfast Agreement, mm. right? You know, the, there's supposed to be motorways and whatever. And then there was supposed to be a dairy to... They also got that extra billion quid, didn't they, from uh, from Theresa May? I don't know where it's gone. <laughs> I don't know where it's gone. A billion quid. But they, that was part yeah. of the deal, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Should that only last you one hospital down here? <laughs> exactly. Get the, get the, get the, you, you get the, you know, the, the, the Seamus Mallon wing yeah. of the hospital. <laughs> John Hume wing. But, I mean, the, it is interesting and that... The whole northwest of the country should be serviced by decent infrastructure links. Yeah, because it's not it's, even a train. It's not even a train, right? Yeah. And, I mean, I've got the bus up to Derry, which is actually the easiest way to travel because in the bus, you actually get the bus up the source. You kind of fall asleep in the bus, put your headphones mm. in, whatever. But, I mean, 
it is extraordinary that a city like Derry and a big town like Letterkenny, I mean, these are big, big places. And it's the whole northwest of the country mm. has got the worst connective tissue in terms of infrastructure. I, as I said, there was supposed to be a motorway built and then we ran out of money in 2008. And... But nothing's been built since. Yeah. And I, I must admit, if, if we listeners up in that next of the woods, and I know we have, a, there's, there's quite a lot of you up there. In actual fact, I heard the nicest things, the nicest compliments to the podcast, right? Go on, yeah. Uh, I was giving a talk at the Atlantic Technological University, which is a new university up there in Letterkenny. Huge state-of-the-art thing, right? About Brilliant. four or 5,000 students yeah. from all around the place. So it's, again, you, what you see is there's amazing stuff going on up there, okay? And I, we, I was giving a chat, and a lot of people came up, a lot, a lot of listeners. Actually, I've got to give a shout-out. Shout out to Paul McCallion from County Donegal, who's working for the United Nations HCR in Bangladesh, Cox Bazaar, the biggest refugee camp in Bangladesh. Wow, come on, Paul! He is a religious listener. This is his. This is his. Basically, he's. This is his beaming in from Ireland oh, every week. So, Paul McCallion, Sandra Buchanan, who I think is your missus, asked me to give you a big shout out <laughs> in Bangladesh. A listener to on, the podcast. Paul. Come on, Paul. And hopefully when you're home, we might see you in the flesh at certain stage. But another lad came up to me and he said, I'm listening to the podcast. He's got two boys, right? Yeah. I think they were like 13 and 11. Yeah. And he was driving from Donegal to Belfast, okay? And he said to me, look, he said to the kids, I shut up now, I'm going to listen to this podcast. <laughs> so I of economics. <laughs> and so he put the two of us on and we're chatting, 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 chatting. And one of the kids after about 10 minutes says, is that economics? Leave it on. What? Which I think is great. <laughs> So the kids were going to say like, oh, Our dad, dad economics, Jesus, dad. And okay. a, you know, economics is the new rock and roll, man. Tell you, man. So <laughs> listen, anyway, that, that was going to go. But when you go to the likes of Terry, we just, it's, it's, it has to be connected. And Absolutely. Of course it does. You know, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it is not. So, uh, so, so it's not. So that's, that, that's been on my mind, John. But you were thinking about Pink Floyd, I believe. Well, no, I, I was saying this to you earlier, and it's just that we were talking about Springsteen. And Bowie Bonds and all. Springsteen, the great Bond trader. Yeah, indeed. Absolutely. But then I was reading during the week there that Pink Floyd are putting their back catalogue up for sale for 500 million. Now, I think that's a bargain, to be honest with you. So do I. Getting less. (laughs) Dark Side of the Moon, Wish You Were Here and nothing else? No, the the wall, the division bell, all that. You, You know, I worked on the division bell, by the way. By in, the way, here in we go. Dave Gilmore's studio. You didn't? Okay, I hold did, on. So yeah. you can't just drop, I worked. Anyway, no, anyway. No, wait, wait, wait. You can't just say, I worked <laughs> on a Pink Floyd album in Dave Gilmore's studio. Tell me more. Uh, it, I, what Bob Ezrin was producing. Bob Ezrin is a fantastic producer. He produced The Wall. He produced uh, uh, lots of Lou Reed stuff, all that kind of stuff. He's anyway. like the Bill Shankly of producers. Yeah. Right, okay. So, Put so, him in context for me. But I used to work a lot with Michael Kamen, who's a film scorer, who also did all the orchestral stuff for The Wall. But they needed a hand for a few days. So I went, That's very cool. I'll, I'll do that. But the coolest thing about it was, it was down in Dave Gilmore's studio, which was a barge on the Thames, down in Hampton Court. Fantastic. And uh, so... So I was in the, the studio on the barge, working away, chit-chatting away. And these canoeists come up to the window, sort of banging on the window. <laughs> Just, it's an amazing place, an amazing and studio to work And then they says, Dave Gilmore's changed. <laughs> but the funny thing about them selling the back catalogue is the fact that it's there on the table. The deal is there to be done, but they can't agree. Like, these lads are well into the 70s. I don't know what age they are exactly, but they're well into their 70s. And they're all scrapping. And they're Al Codgers still scrapping away since... Over money. Over money. Although Roger Waters did say, and we'll move on after this, but Roger Waters did say one of the sticking points is the war in Ukraine. Roger Waters reckons that... He's pro-Russian, isn't he? Well, I suppose he is pro-Russian, but what he said was that this war could have been avoided if the West engaged and reassured Russia and all that. So he's kind of taking Putin's line. And on the flip side, Dave Gilmore and Nick Mason put out a single supporting uh, Ukraine. Ukraine. Right. But Roger Waters reckons that he's he's a marked man in Ukraine. He's on a hit list in Ukraine. It's just nonsense. I know, it's nonsense. Rock and roll. Rock and roll. Well, (laughs) the interesting thing is it shows that Bruce Springsteen is a particularly brilliant investor and Pink Floyd are particularly bad investors because 
the back catalogs price, as we talked last week, and we're going to talk about the bond market again. We're also going to talk about a dilemma in economics, which should be a really good dilemma, which is not enough workers, but is actually regarded by economists as a bad dilemma. So we're going to talk yeah. about this. We're going to talk about the bizarre immorality of economics. That's the topic of this right. podcast. Nice. But just briefly, when Bruce Springsteen sold his back catalogue, the rate of interest on Fed funds was close to zero. Okay, I think it was 2.5, 0.25%. Meaning that the discount rate on the price and the value of the asset, the asset being the stream of income that was coming from Bruce Springsteen's records or albums or whatever, was very low, which means that Bruce Springsteen trousered loads of money. Mm. Now Pink Floyd are trying to sell their assets but the discount rate's going to be about 5%. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the actual back catalogue... They missed the boat. Be, they missed the boat. They missed yeah. the barge. <laughs> hey, I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's talk about bonds. Let's talk about bonds. Flip it around. Before we continue, we're delighted to bring you a small segment in partnership with Irish Life. We've recently done an episode in partnership with Irish Life where we talked about pensions why they're useful, why they're important, and all that kind of stuff. But more importantly, how your choice of pension can have a real impact on, say, climate change, much more than doing the usual recycling and taking the bus okay. to work and all that That's kind cool. of stuff. Yeah, well, it, was, it was a good episode. I enjoyed it. We were talking about the oranges of pensions, we're going back to the Roman times, remember the, the clutch of the drachma, is, yeah. the handful. And we looked at the current state of pensions in Ireland and talked about how pensions can work for both you, your money, and the environment. So do, talk to me a bit more about this, Mac. Well, what can we do about pensions and be well, more well, eco-friendly? I, I think, and that look, kind of look, stuff? The, the whole thing about pensions, John, is you've got to look after your future. And as we've always said, that most of us don't think beyond next week or the week after. Yeah. And then suddenly you end up on your inner retirement situation. You haven't put money aside. And suddenly you actually end up very, very poor during your retirement or your income falls dramatically. Mm. So I suppose there's a couple of things you can do, right? If you don't have a pension, you can contact a broker who can help you set up a pension and can kind of guide you through all the various funds and all that sort of stuff. And if you want to invest in eco-friendly companies, go for that. If you already have one, you can get in touch with your broker to see how your money is actually being invested. And if your pension is through an employer or your employer, Talk to the HR department to find out where your money is going. Make your voice heard, again, if you want it to be eco-friendly. But at the fundamental point, John, about pensions, right, is that most of us have no idea what's coming around the corner. Mm. And most of us think, you know, my income's okay and it's doing well. And then something happens and you haven't set stuff aside because you really never got around to it. It wasn't because you just weren't thinking. Yeah. And then what you find, I mean, throughout history, Being old has equated with being poor. And the question now is whether or not you want to take that risk or whether you want to actually mitigate that risk by putting money aside now. Yeah, absolutely. So there you have it. There's a few quick tips that you can take immediately to be more eco-friendly. We'd like to thank Irish Life Pensions for bringing you this segment. They're paving the way forward for pension funds here in Ireland, and we're delighted to work with them on this. Now back to our conversation. So, Mac, what's this dilemma you're on, or the immorality? This is the immorality, right? This is the base immorality of economists or economics perceptions of unemployment, right? Mm. So what a, something is happening in the global economy at the moment, which can be really summed up with where have all the workers gone? So if you go to any part of Ireland, if you go to any part of the UK, if you go all over Europe and certainly in the United States, what you will find, you talk to anyone in business, mm. and despite the fact that people are worried about energy prices, inflation, recession, etc., You talk to any small business or big business and they'll say, our biggest dilemma is we can't get workers. We can't get baristas. We can't get baristas. I mean, what can you possibly do, John? We can't get baristas, right? But we can't get workers in anything. If you talk to big companies, small companies, in services, in manufacturing, construction, the main conundrum is they can't get workers. 
You go out to the west of Ireland in particular during tourist season and you talk to anybody. You were out in Randstone recently, yeah, right? You yeah. go to anybody in the tourist business, hoteliers, publicans, restaurateurs, all that whole area, right? Or even people, bus drivers, anything that demands physical labor, right? Yeah. They all say, we cannot get any workers. We don't have enough workers. You ask in the construction industry, it's exactly the same. If you ask in services, it's exactly the same. So the dilemma is, where have all the yeah, workers where, where, gone? Yeah, where the hell have they gone? No, no, it's a really important question, right? Because yeah. if you are running out of workers, it puts economics on its head. So economics at its fundamental essence is about scarcity. It's about making choices and conditions of scarcity, mm. which involve trade-offs. So typically what happens is economists say, okay, there's a scarcity of this thing. Mm. How do we make choices? How do so we allocate? supply and demand. Supply basic, and demand sort of thing, right? So that's the first thing. Demand. The second thing is there has always been, since the 1960s, a presumption that there will be more workers than demand for workers, so that unemployment is a thing that we must deal with. Which okay. is reasonable enough, given the fact that we've growing populations and... All that sort of stuff. Yeah, so it's reasonable yeah. enough. But statistics out of the States this week tell you something extraordinary. There's a series in America called the Jolt series, which are all about the job market, okay? Right. And the Jolt series this week shows us that this week in the United States, there are 10.1 million openings Right, so the 10.1 million job efforts out there. Right. So basically, you take across all the, job, the board. Across, across the board. Right? So, yeah, so, yeah. right. There are six million unemployed Americans. Mm -hmm. So it means there are four million excess jobs. So there are four million jobs out there that cannot be filled by the labor force. I would say exactly the same. If we had the same level of detailed data, we'd find the same in Ireland. We'd find the same in the UK. Yeah. We'd find the same all over Europe. So what you have is you have an extraordinary demand for labor. You have a supply of labor that is falling. Yeah. So basically you have excess jobs, not excess unemployment, right? So this drives a wedge through what central banks are trying to do. So central banks are trying to do the following. They're saying, okay, inflation is high. Energy prices are high. We spoke to Neil Atkinson the other day yeah. about energy prices being high and why, and the fact the oil market is very, very tight, all that sort of stuff, right? So the central banks were saying, okay, inflation is now running at 6 7% in the United States, mm. right? We call it with the states because it leads the way everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Jay Powell is saying, okay, do you know what we're going to do? We are going to get it down to 2%. How do we do that? We increase interest rates to such an extent that we crush demand, that's exactly what they're doing, right? Yeah, yeah. We embrace the increase in unemployment as a good thing, which pushes down the rate of inflation because as unemployment increases, there's more and more people chasing fewer and fewer jobs. Hold, hold on. Yes. Hold on. Are you saying that the central bank's remit and their goal is to cause unemployment? Now, that is, we're at the core. So Really? I mean... Yes, yes, yes. Right, so, okay, go on, explain this. So let's, let's, This let's, is wrong. This is wrong, right? So let's explain the way in which economics has framed the economy and the fight against inflation over the last 40 years is that unemployment is a reasonable cost to pay in the fight against inflation. It's called the Nairu, that this is great economic stuff. It's called right. the non inflation accelerating rate of unemployment. Right. So we start, this is, Nairu. Right. Okay, okay, let's okay. go back to economics 101. Yeah. So at the core of macroeconomics is this idea that the central bank and the government are in a battle for the right to say who controls the rate of growth of the economy. The government will always want the rate of growth to be higher because mm -hmm. they will want unemployment to be lower Yeah, because people will then go to the polls and say, that government is better than the last one because I have a job. Not to mention also the tax take as well. Tax take and all that yeah, sort of yeah, stuff, yeah. but just, just that basic idea. Mm. And they always say, you know, that I, the idea of the difference between a downturn and a recession, right? Yeah. A downturn is when your mate loses your job. A recession is when you lose your job, right? <laughs> right. Okay. okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So 
the central bank is sitting here. The government is always pushing down on the accelerator, trying to drive the economy at peak performance, right? Now, what typically happens then is if the economy is at peak performance, the demand when the economy goes up, the demand for labor goes up, mm. the rate of unemployment falls. As the rate of unemployment falls, less and less workers are around. Therefore, wage rates rise. And as the economy takes off, wage rates rise and therefore inflation rises. Yes. Okay. Because wages are the foundational price of the economy. Yeah. Okay. So the central bank is looking at this. So the government's pushing down on the accelerator, right? Mm. The central bank has its hand on the handbrake. And what it's trying to do is it's trying to bear down on inflation. Mm. So what they're saying is, hold on a second, we're going to yank up the handbrake, i.e. we're going to raise interest rates yeah. to bring down the demand for labour, right. to bring down real wages, to bring down the rate of inflation. And do a few donuts. And do a few donuts, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So imagine Jay Powell, yeah. okay? Jay Powell is, as we speak, in a robbed Honda Civic <laughs> on the long mile road yeah. doing donuts, okay? That's your thing, okay? So... That's it. So the accelerator break, accelerator break, right, right? Okay. But the fundamental relationship that dominates and drives this thinking is called the Phillips curve. And yes. The Phillips yes, curve yeah. comes from a 1950s observation that a government can either have high growth with high inflation, but they can't have high growth with low inflation. Okay. So there's a trade-off between growth and inflation. So the higher the level of growth, the higher the level of inflation. Mm. And again, it comes from the fact that the higher level of growth, the higher the demand for labor, the lower the rate of unemployment, you run out of workers, wages are high, end of story. Yeah. Right. But it's, it's funny, though. It's just when you're talking about this, and it's very matter of fact, that the human element, yes. like, like the, the unemployment, is it's not just a job. It's somebody's livelihood. It's a family. It's kids. It's prosperity. It's, it's everything. It's psychological. It, yeah. it's, it's mental health. It's all that sort of stuff. So this is why there's a small part of me hates economics. Yeah. Yeah. Which is the way in which economists, it's the men in the white suits, right? They regard unemployment as a tolerable consequence of bad economic policy. But the interesting thing is, those fuckers are never unemployed. I was just about to say that. Yeah. And 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 we know what unemployment's yeah. like. We I'd suffered it when I, you know, when, when my dad lost his job when yeah, we were kids. Yeah, yeah. But also we know loads of friends of ours have lost their jobs and gone through periods where things don't work out. And the psychological and emotional cost of unemployment is so profound. And nobody should ever forget that. Mm. As I've always said, you know, that unemployment obliterates the future because when you're unemployed, you cannot plan for the yeah, future. Yeah, yeah. So your entire time horizon, and I've always looked at poverty and unemployment and being outside of the mainstream economically, right, falling behind as a thing about time, that when you're rich, I was reading something about your man, Elon Musk, right, talking yeah. about living on fucking Mars. Yeah. That's only rich people can think like that. Yeah, Okay. Yeah, yeah. Rich people's time horizons are vast. That's very true. That's why rich people have investment advisors to save for when they are old, mm. right? Poor people's time horizons are tomorrow. Yeah. Because and you today. don't. Yeah. Today and tomorrow, right? So the problem is that the middle class, the wealthy class, have the privilege of being able to plan for the future. Mm. Poverty and people who are poor can't plan for the future. Problem is, if you can't plan for the future, is you can't invest in what economists talk about your human capital. Okay, so yeah. you can't go to college yeah. or you can't get education. But it's because, all, but it's also not just that. It's also why you know the Green New Deal and and all these environmental, which are long term plans that need to be implemented. But it's very hard for somebody on a low wage or who's unemployed to think in terms of. What's good for the environment? What's the right yeah, thing to yeah, do? Yeah, you know? yeah. So you're absolutely right. So like, I mean, unemployment and poverty, it, this, this idea, it obliterates the future. So therefore you force people to live in the present. Mm. And when you force people to live in the present, you force people to actually, in some way, forget about 
themselves next year, the year after, mm. two years hence, five years hence. And when you can't make plans, your sense of yourself and the world diminishes profoundly. And that's what unemployment does. But economists, not all, but many, many in the mainstream, mm. regard unemployment as simply what happens when the economy is out of kilter. Yeah, it's just the a number. the basic idea, exactly. The basic idea here is, so, you know, the I am the one in 10 by UB40. Yeah. Tanya, yeah, man. little bit, little, <laughs> little bit, sorry, little bit of early. That was their only good song, by the way. A bit of early uh, 1980s trivia yeah. from UB40, I think a Birmingham-based band. Yes, they were. And UB40 actually is the unemployment benefit form in the UK. Yeah. And that's where it comes from. And I am a one in 10, which was basically in response to Mrs. Thatcher's extreme monetarism of the early 1980s saying, unemployment is a price worth paying, which she said. Yeah. So let's go back, right? Unemployment, that, that relationship between- Sorry, she actually said that? Yeah. Right, I didn't right. realise that was a quote from but, her. But she wasn't unemployed. Yes, of so course. It's yeah, easy yeah. to say that. But I mean, basically, so the whole idea of the Phillips curve is based on this relationship, right? But it's all entirely based on the notion that there will be an excess of labour, that there will always be more people looking for a job than jobs available. Mm. So if you ask people of our age, for example, and who were running companies 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they'd put out a you know an ad in the paper or whatever for X job. They'd get about five or six candidates or maybe 15 or 20. Yeah. Or in Ireland in the 1980s and 1990s, you'd get 200 <laughs> candidates, yeah. right? Yeah, okay. yeah. Now, if you put out a job, you get nothing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, what it means is the central banks who are trying to crush demand by increasing interest rates are assuming that the rate of unemployment will rise and that will cause wages to fall. Yeah. But the assumption is based on there being a surplus of labor. But if there is a deficit of labor, they won't be able to do what they've always done. So let's come back this to the Nairu, right? Yes. No, yeah, yeah. So economists talked about what was the rate of unemployment that is consistent with low levels of inflation. Mm. So was it 8%? Was it 9%? Was it 6%? And they identified the Nairu. Think about this, right? The non-inflation accelerating rate of unemployment. So what they basically said was the rate of unemployment is the anchor around which we will base economic policy. And we will then say, well, it could be 8%. Now, 8% unemployment in a country like Ireland, for example, yeah. you're talking hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. Okay? yeah, 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 yeah. But that was the perception. And the idea was that we will keep the rate of inflation low because we have lots of people on the dole. So therefore, wages can't rise and people, workers, will cannibalize each other, fighting against each other. Yeah, 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 yeah. For the benefit of the boss classes, the people who are employing. Yeah. Now, that has changed. That was 30 years, 20 years, and certainly 40 years ago, the way. What we're now looking at is a total, total change, which I think is not the Nairu, the non inflation accelerating rate of unemployment. Mm. I think it's the inflation accelerating rate of unemployment. <laughs> Go on, explain. So I think explain. what's going to happen is now we're in a, a period that wage inflation, because we've run out of workers, is going to remain very, very high. And simply suggesting that you can raise interest rates to bring down wage rates assumes that you're going to find workers from somewhere else who are going to compete. But we've run out of workers. So and the question is why? Yeah, well, I was going to say, why is this? And, and then what options does the central bank or the government have? Now, fascinatingly, there was a very interesting editorial in this week's Economist magazine mm -hmm. talking about, wasn't really talking about this. It was, this, it's the same conclusion, right? That the idea that we have now 2%, the world has a 2% inflation rate target, and that's where we're going to, yeah. is probably ridiculous. That's, again, it's like the generals fighting the last war. You will not get back to 2% rate of inflation unless you find a massive amount of unemployed workers somewhere and you put them back into the jobs market, right? Now, this is a fascinating right, okay. idea. It's a fascinating idea. But hang on a second. I'm trying to get my head around this. <laughs> no, where, where are the people gone? It, it's all since COVID, 
Yeah. So COVID kicked in 2020. Everyone down tools and working from home yeah. or, or whatever. We shut the economy down. Now we're opening back up and it's going to take time, obviously, with yeah, yeah. supply chains and all the rest. But where are the people gone? What has changed what has since changed? then? Okay, so so the, the first thing to appreciate is, is the, the difference between the labour force and the participation rate. So the labour force is basically everybody over the age of 16 that is available for work, mm, right? Mm. 16 to 65, right? So it's that massive cohort of the population. So it's basically, you've got your retirees and you've got your yeah. your, your school kids. So the, these are the people who can work, right? The participation rate is the amount of those people who can work who make themselves available for work. And amazingly, the participation rate is only about 60 to 65%. So about 30% of people don't make themselves available for work. Right. And that is... That could be traditional women in the household, housewives, which was a huge chunk years and years ago. Okay, yeah. right. But that has that has contracted dramatically. Yeah, right. Good. Over the over the last yeah. two or three decades. Okay, but still a significant amount of people don't make themselves available for work. A lot of people are ill, all that sort of stuff. Mm. Lots of students aren't available for work. Third level students, fourth level students aren't available for work. People who have got some sort of ailments, all that sort of stuff. Right. Yeah. But what is happening is participation rate seems to have fallen. So lots and lots of people over the age of 55 or 60 have opted out. And lots and lots of people at the other end are not working. So people have stopped working. So they've yeah. disappeared. Now, it seems that since COVID, particularly in the United States, what you've seen is a lot of people have actually said, who are maybe in their late 50s, just said, okay, that's it. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm going to cash in my chips. Now, ironically, the huge, huge wealth effect of the housing market has had a profound effect on this. So okay, what has happened, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. is that people in the middle classes, lower and middle middle classes in the United States, who saw their personal wealth increase dramatically as a result of the increase in their house prices, mm. have actually done the following. They have mortgaged their houses against their retirement pension. So they've said to the banks, look, I'm 60. Let's say I lived 85. I bought this house when I was 20, 25. It's now worth X. Mm. I'm just going to actually give it to you when I die. And you're going to give me a million quid now in lieu of when I die. Yeah. So they've basically remortgaged their, themselves. And their houses, and that's happening wholesale in the States. Right. And it's a, okay. So it's a function of, it's the unintended and unseen consequence of increases house prices is people with homes are cashing in their chips now. Yeah. And they're saying, you know, fuck it, I'm not going to work anymore. So you're saying then that that these funds end up being some of the biggest landowners? So basically what it happens is you, let's say, I've decided, John Davis, you, let's say you're, you're 62. And typically in the States, you would work until you're 66 or 67. And you're thinking, you know, I couldn't be arsed doing this anymore, right? But how do I live? In the old days, if your house was not worth a huge amount, you had no equity. Mm. But what you're saying is you're going to the bank and you're saying, look, I'm going to just cash in my chips now. You'd say, you can have my house, value the house. Let's say the house is worth a million quid, right? Mm. A million dollars. I'm going to get the million dollars now. You can take the house when I die. We'll discount it at a rate of interest. So, so you... Don't give me a million, let's say you give me 900 grand. Mm. And they're just living. And they've opted out of the labour market. Right. And then at the other end, what you see here, for example... Then there's no inheritance. There's no, nothing being passed on. No, you're just, you're just saying, screw yeah. it. The amazing thing about inheritance, it's, the, where, it's where the libertarian right and the extreme Marxist left come together. They both believe that inheritance is a crime. And part of me believes it is too. Mm. That in actual fact, inheritance embeds inequality. Yeah. And what it does is it gives just a lucky person a leg up. So if you're the kid of a rich person, it just gives you a leg up. Yeah. And the interesting is libertarians on the right believe this is fundamentally unfair so that everyone should start as a blank slate and your income and your prospects in life should be a reflection of your investment, your energy, and what you put in. But that's all very well if, if it's a level playing field to start with. I know, but... And then it's also, you know, based on this thing that we spoke about before, a, a meritocracy. Yeah, but what um, they're saying is that 
inheritance is fundamentally yeah, yeah, yeah. unfair. No, I understand that. I yeah. actually believe that. Yeah, I yeah. actually believe that, right? But the Marxist left believe it exactly the same. But what they're saying is it's not because... So the libertarian and the right are saying it's because your efforts mm. don't become the main determinant of your position in society. The Marxist left are saying it's got nothing to do with efforts. It's just to do with the insane insanity of 1% of the population owning 50% of the assets, yeah, yeah, which yeah. means that there's going to be a drone class of little Lord Fauntleroy's knocking around the place, okay? <laughs> but to come back on, to the on, dynamic, on, the yeah. dynamic is as the wealth of the average person rises because of the house price inflation of the last 15 years, lots and lots of people are opting out. And they're going to Acapulco, or wherever Americans go. I don't know where they go. They go to Cancun or wherever they go when they get it. Put that man in the flowery shirt and give him a pina colada with a pineapple in it. And just let him sit there, you know, Chad. Hey, Chad. Okay. Okay, but that's, that's America. What's going on here then? Well, what's going on here is that we're seeing huge emigration in Ireland of people in their early 20s. Yes. Because, yeah. ironically, of the housing problem again. Yeah. So it's the flip problem of the housing problem. In America, high house prices are allowing the old, as I always said, house prices are a smash and grab exercise from the old against the young. Mm. So the old have robbed the young of their future, right? Yeah. And so therefore in America, the older ones, now the reason the American older ones are important is because the baby boom is at a different cycle in America. So American baby okay. boomers, right? American baby boomers started in 19... 47, 1948, okay? Things maybe, I think it's like, oh, 15, 1945, the baby boom after the Second World yeah, War. So the yeah. GIs come back and they have loads of babies. So that's the huge bulge. It's kind of the Bill Clintons in the yeah. American population. Baby booms. Our baby booms were the Pope's children. Yes. So our baby boom came 40 years after the yeah. Americans. Yeah, yeah. So this stuff in America does not apply to us at that level of the demographic curve. So that's why American retirees are much more important in the overall feel of the American economy to us, right? Yeah. The Brits are much more like the Americans, actually. We're way behind because we have the most bizarre, Ireland has the most bizarre, bizarre demographics in the world. Yeah. Right? We because, been, because of immigration. Because of immigration and because we didn't have babies. Because of immigration, number one. Yeah. And because of the legacy, extraordinarily, of the famine which actually took three or four generations to play out. So Irish people's fertility collapsed. We know the Malthusian idea. Yeah. So Malthus was this idea that once a society gets a shock, right, like a famine, future generations adopt coping mechanisms to avoid that in the future, right? So the shock of the famine... Kind of subconsciously. We, yeah, so we didn't have kids. Right. So Irish people stopped having children. So basically, a tiny percentage of Irish people had a huge amount of children, yeah. okay? Families of 12 and 13. But in those families of 12 and 13, there was regularly three unmarried sisters yeah. and three unmarried brothers. Yes. So and that, if you go back to your grandparents, you'll find that's the pattern. Yeah. And it took a long, long time for that. And it took two or three generations for that to actually seep out of the system. So it was only by the 1970s that we actually became normal suburban Community, a normal right. suburban demographic. Yeah. Basically, the 60s and 70s, our generation, yes. were yeah, the yeah. first normal demographic generation of Ireland, yeah. which after the famine, which is yeah. kind of mad. Normal being the... <laughs> normal being the... Well, normal being that most people had kids and didn't have that many. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That, As opposed to abnormal, which was that most people didn't have kids yeah, around. Yeah, having but, football teams. But those who did had 15 of them, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So now we are in a different situation where our demographic pressures, where there's a scarcity, are amongst young, qualified people. And the reason is they are emigrating. And the reason they're emigrating is precisely the same problem, the housing market. Mm. So London is full of them. New York is full of yeah, them. Yeah. The podcast is full of people all over, of Irish people all over the world listening to us. Yeah. You know, Vancouver, Toronto, everywhere. What I love about it is even more extreme places, like our friend in Bangladesh, yes. right? But, <laughs> so those people are gone. So that's why restaurants, bars, services have no people. Yeah. But the dilemma, and I come back to it, is if your entire macroeconomic strategy is based on compressing inflation via wages, your assumption is wages can fall, 
But wages cannot fall if you have no people, if you haven't enough supply, if you have too much demand. And that means maybe that the inflationary battle is going to go on for a long time. And the final thought on that is, does it mean, and this was the editorial of The Economist this week, which is mm. a good, well, well worth it, so well figured out, that the idea that you will have a 2% inflation target and around that you will orbit your economy, maybe you have to have a 5% inflation target. So our tolerance of inflation has to rise to reflect the fact that wages cannot fall because there aren't enough workers. And in order to do that, that would profoundly change everything. So that means that at the end of the day, profits will fall, wages will rise. You're absolutely so, spoken like a true Marxist. <laughs> <laughs> this, I'm raising my this, fist as we speak. <laughs> this is John Illich Lenin <laughs> Davidoff. So it's kind of a good thing. I think it's a good thing. So basically, do you remember we talked about the idea of pendulum swings in economics? Mm. That, you know, there's great swings and pendulums and ideas. And, and the interesting thing about it is, you know, the way you, you, got, you know, they say you've a run on the banks and things. Mm. You can have a run on ideas. That an idea just loses its currency and yeah. suddenly something else comes in and there's a new paradigm and there's a new idea. So in the 1980s, 1990s, the pendulum swung away from wages towards profits. So you get this extraordinary increase in profits and the people who, are, as we say in the podcast, who depended on dividends and asset prices and rents yeah. for their income, they saw their position in society elevate dramatically. And the people who depended on wages for their income, which is the majority, mm. saw their position in society erode. And that was measured in what we call inequality, income inequality mm. and wealth inequality. And now you're absolutely right. Now we're just doing the opposite. Pendulum swinging away from profits, back to wages. Because in GDP, there's only two things. There's wages and profits, right? Mm. So if you sell something, either the person who owns the stuff gets the money, yeah. or the people who made the stuff, the workers, get the money. So basically, now we're seeing a pendulum swing away from profits, back to wages. Wages will be higher, and therefore inflation could be higher. And if inflation is higher for longer... It means that all these asset prices we're talking about have to reset themselves against a higher discount rate, which means that in financial markets, we're in for a very rocky ride. 